Good morning, everyone. I would like to open the 184 period of sessions of the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights with the first hearing, which is entitled Human Rights and Neurotechnologies. It was requested by several representatives of civil society organizations. My name is Julissa Mantilla Falcon. I'm the president of the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights. And here with me today are Commissioner Joel Hernandez and Roberta Clark. Also, we have the Assistant Executive Secretary, Maria Claudia Pulido, and the Special Rapporteur for Economic, Social, Cultural, and Environmental Rights, Soledad Garcia Muñoz, will be joining us. I would like to explain how time will be distributed. Civil society organizations will have 30 minutes. Please introduce yourselves as you speak. Then the Inter-American Commission will have 30 minutes to participate, and we will be concluded with some comments by civil society organizations. I just would like to remind all of you that we have a timer to measure time. We have simultaneous interpretation and closed captioning. And the hearings are streamlined and they are the hearings recordings will be available at the YouTube channel. Good morning. We are opening this hearing. Good morning. My name is Moises Sanchez. I'm the executive director of Fundación Camenao. I am here to present uh, today. I would like to thank the IACHR for allowing us because this is a very important issue due to technological advances. Neurotechnology is a great opportunity for humankind. There are a lot of progress made in the area of health, but there are a lot of challenges as well in terms of privacy, uh, the health agenda, the ESER agenda, and also for persons with disabilities. And today we want to present this. There are several organizations that will be presenting today. They will be introducing themselves and they will comment according to the times that have been established. Jared Kenser will speak first. My name is Jared Genzer and uh, a general counsel to the Neuro Rights Foundation, a U.S. nonprofit organization which collaborates with the uh, with international organizations, national governments, and industry to help ensure the ethical development of neurotechnology. Uh, thank you uh, to the Inter-American uh, Commission uh, for uh, organizing this important briefing today. Um, although neurotechnology creates novel opportunities for both scientific breakthroughs and economic development, it also raises unprecedented human rights and privacy rights implications. In 2017, the Morningside Group, a collective of 25 global experts, proposed five so-called neuro rights to protect citizens from the misuse or abuse of neurotechnology. This includes rights to mental identity or a sense of self, to mental agency or free will, to mental privacy, to fair access to mental augmentation, and to protection from algorithmic bias when neurotechnology is combined with artificial intelligence. Uh, these neural rights are reflected in the August 2021 Declaration of the Inter-American Juridical Committee, which calls upon states to regulate neurotechnology while highlighting the absence of uniform standards for doing so. Under the American Convention on Human Rights, individuals have rights of privacy, uh, equal protection of the law, and mental integrity, Yet the contours of these rights with respect to neurotechnology are ill-defined. On May 6, 2022, the Neural Rights Foundation published International Human Rights Protection Gaps in the Age of Neurotechnology, the world's first comprehensive review of the UN-authored International Human Rights Treaties as applied to neurotechnology. Ultimately, our report finds that existing treaties are inadequate to protect neural rights and both represents the first step towards a set of uniform standards on neural rights that nations can incorporate into their national laws and recommends specific ways that international human rights law as it exists today can evolve to protect neural rights. If implemented, these recommendations would make the obligation to protect neural rights legally upon, uh, binding upon states' parties to those treaties analyzed in the report. Many of the report's recommendations 
uh, summarized in a uh, brief chart uh, that I've attached to my presentation can be adapted for the inter-American human rights system. During, uh, due to neurotechnology's unprecedented implications um, uh, and potential abuse as a surveillance tool, the Inter-American Commission could adopt a resolution defining neural rights and establishing standards to protect them. For, examples, uh, for example, Chile's constitutional amendment explicitly limits the processing of neurodata, and the Commission could adopt a resolution endorsing this kind of standard. Further, our report recommends in the UN context the creation of a high-level panel or expert group on neurotechnology, neural rights, and neuroethics. Similarly, the Commission through an agreement through a specific government, for example, could create an interdisciplinary group of independent experts to study the use of neurotechnology for surveillance and the processing of neurodata. Uh, our report also recommends the creation of a new UN Special Rapporteur on Neurotechnology and Human Rights. Uh, and uh, by analogy, the Commission could create or add to an existing rapporteur's mandate. In the long term, the Commission could consider requesting an advisory opinion from the Inter-American Court on Human Rights concerning the circumstances under which neurodata processing might violate the American Convention, especially the right to equal protection. Thank you for inviting me uh, and the Neural Rights Foundation today to um, present, and we look forward to continued collaboration. Uh, you can learn more about our work and find our recent report at neurorightsfoundation.org. Muchas gracias. Good morning to the commissioners who are here. My name is Silvia Serrano Guzman. I'm director of the initiative of um, human rights of O'Neill Institute for National and Global Health Law in Georgetown University. We know that new neurotechnology is an important tool to promote the right to health, and it could include tools for the inclusion of persons with disabilities. What we know so far regarding these technologies um, help us to identify that there are some tensions that should be addressed by member states of the OAS with the support of competent parties such as the Inter-American Commission and the Inter-American Court. I would like to mention these tensions. First, I would like to mention the first tension that has to do with private life. Neural data should be considered as part of the private lives of people, and therefore, they should be included in the protection against arbitrary interventions. States should abstain from adopt uh, from some actions and should adopt all the necessary measures so that neurotechnologies are not used for intelligence, surveillance, or any other actions that affect the private lives of persons. The second tension has to do with the rights that have to do with autonomy of persons. Taking into consideration that some new technologies that go beyond privacy, because their potential is not about reading or interpreting neural data. They could modify data or modify behaviors. And therefore, these technologies could impact on the autonomous exercise of freedoms and rights, such as political rights, right of association of freedom, and freedom of expression. The third tension has to do with the right to health. Since neurotechnologies, if they are not accessible in an equal way, they could uh, prevent um, access to persons with disabilities, depending on their ability to pay for those technologies. It's important to consider that the right to non-discrimination should be considered an immediate obligation. The fourth tension has to do with the right to quality and non-discrimination. Neurotechnologies have the potential to deepen the gaps that exist today, not only in terms of health, but also because there could be unequal access to neurotechnologies that could lead to arbitrary differences between groups, including, for example, the digital divide. And the third, the fifth tension has to do with procedural safeguards that should be considered regarding neurotechnology and its application. 
the accountability mechanisms and the availability of legal remedies to guarantee the protection of potentially affected human rights. Also, the legal framework in businesses and human rights is central to consider state obligations in terms of neurotechnology development. I would like to conclude by saying that as our experience uh, has proved certain, the commission has several mechanisms to interpret the rulings of the Inter-American Court and other human rights instruments. And in the future, it, with the right consensus, states in the region should have a binding instrument in this matter. We consider that the commission already has at its disposal several mechanisms to guide states, and this will be included in our petition. Thank you so much. Good morning. My name is Juan Fernando Cordova. I'm researcher and professor. I have studied the relationships between technology and human rights in Savannah University. We know that technology has changed the situation of persons with disabilities. And then the UN Convention, we can observe that new technologies can play a key role for communication and for the elimination of barriers. Among the general obligations for state parties, we have the obligation to protect persons and to guarantee availability for technolo of technologies for persons with disabilities. The development of use of new technologies is crucial to achieve the elimination of barriers and to promote greater inclusion, especially for persons with disabilities. Regarding the impact uh, of technologies, we have neurotechnology because this could lead to different brain body interfaces with technology and artificial interfaces. These interfaces could help persons with disabilities to overcome physical and social barriers and also promote their inclusion. Some of the studies conducted so far made reference to the possibility of helping persons with disabilities to move their extremities through technologies, especially for those persons that have severe damage of their spinal cord. Anyhow, one of the aspects that is more attractive in the future has to do with those new technologies that would allow for communication of persons who, because of their disability, cannot communicate freely. And also this will help interaction of persons we ha who have issues with communication. Neurotechnology could help them to eliminate those barriers and to guarantee the uh, warranty established in Article 12 of the American Convention. And therefore this international instrument establishes that state parties should define the necessary measures to guarantee the effective access to this legal warranty. And this includes also should take into consideration the autonomy of persons with disabilities. Neurotechnology, especially those who use this BCI, could be the most adequate instrument to guarantee the legal freedom of a person. However, the use of new technology, neurotechnologies for persons with disabilities implies several risks for these people. The convention warns about the need to protect persons against these abuses. There are some potential risks in terms of the fidelity of the statements done through BCI technologies, the manipulation of thoughts the possession of the property rights of these persons, also the violation of privacy and the conditioning of personality and the loss of autonomy of persons with disabilities. To address these risks, it's important that we interpret the ESCERs included in inter-American and in universal systems in order for persons with disabilities to have access to these rights. We need to adequate the current 
rights. We are talking about mental privacy, psychological privacy, democratization of access to neurotechnologies. The Inter-American system faces the big challenge of making the rights for persons with disabilities effective. We know that in the future, neurotechnologies will be used to address the needs of this population. Good morning, everyone. My name is Maria Jose Escudero. I'm co-founder of Fundación Ronda, and I'm really honored to be here with you today. Fundación Ronda, together with civil society organizations who work uh, with persons of dis with disabilities, we understand that technology is relevant to promote the inclusion of persons with disabilities. Around the world, there are over 1 billion persons with disabilities, and that is accounts for 15% of the population, according to the WHO. And therefore, persons with disabilities should be considered subjects of rights or holders of rights, and therefore they should have the same freedoms and rights as all other persons and they should have the same equal opportunities in society. According to our experience and the data that we have collected over the years, working together with civil society organizations and persons with disabilities, help us understand that persons with disabilities face several issues regarding participation and access to different rights, such as health and work. And therefore, Currently, assistive technologies are underdeveloped and neurotechnology was developed first in the clinical context. But in recent years, we are seeing that these technologies are using for recreational use. And therefore, these technologies are not handled by states only, we are seeing seen an increase of private investment in neurotechnologies for recreational purposes. Neurotechnologies can have a positive impact on the lives and the quality of the lives of people. However, they can help also to develop diagnosis and assistive technologies. Currently, scientists around the world are developing new technologies that could help develop new treatments for Alzheimer's, depression, among other, many other diseases. Also, the use of BCI in persons with multiple uh, multilateral sclerosis help these persons write or communicate. However, in spite of the potential of new technologies to improve human condition, we see that there are several challenges regarding health and the protection of human rights. Human thoughts could be decodified and manipulated by technology. And therefore, we need to protect and guarantee the non-violation of the persons, of the rights of the persons with disabilities. Especially, we need to protect the right to autonomy and mental dignity of persons with disabilities. This implies the inter that there is no intervention of the human bra brain without people's consent. Also, persons with disabilities should be able to enjoy their rights with the support of the state. We believe that in order to be successful with neurotechnologies applied to persons with disabilities in research and use processes, we need to consider a way to reduce risks. And therefore, there should be a significant participation of persons with disabilities in these development processes. We need to build those technologies based on the needs of persons with disabilities. Muy, muy buenos días. Soy Ramiro Orías. Hello everyone. My name is Ramiro Orías. I'm a member of the Legal Commission of, um, of Inter-American Legal Community um, Convention, and we study the uh, ethical uh, implications of the development of new neurological technologies in relation to their impact on human rights. 
and we have realized there's a normative loophole in that field and a need to move forward in its regulation with a human rights perspective. So our commission, our committee, sorry, has been analyzing this, reflecting on this, along with an international group of experts. And we are trying to um, bring the region out of this uh, delay that was uh, on this issue that considering the recent developments in the global discussion is something that um, needs a new international special legal regime. Now, over the basis of the substantive reflections we made with our group of experts, our committee last uh, August approved its declaration on neuroscience, neurotechnologies, and human rights, new legal challenges for the Americas, which was the first pronouncement of an OAS organization on this issue. This declaration is initially focused on identifying a set of concerns that have to do with this articulation between neurosciences, neurotechnologies, and human rights. The legal framework, this analysis was made on is the um, Inter-American Charter, the American Convention, the Declaration and its protocols, and uh, the always focusing on the centrality of the dignity of human beings. Our declaration points out some concerns relating the impact these sciences may have in terms of fundamental freedoms, um, human dignity, the development of autonomy, the right to privacy, to intimacy, freedom of thought, physical and psychological integrity, health, and equality before the law. So our declaration has five axes for reflection, one that has to do with personality and the loss of autonomy, um, legitimate interventions in terms of health and personal integrity, mental privacy and the protection of data, and finally, the equality of access and non-discrimination. And finally, our declaration determines to continue to treat this issue and to um, continue to develop these concerns through a document that synthesizes a group of inter-American principles that may help orienting national regulations that are required. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. My name is Annalie Tinchon. I was part of the group of experts that collaborated with the Inter-American Legal Committee of the OAS with the objective of uh, providing technical resources for the discussion. This initiative dates back to a couple of years later when Dr. Rafael Yuste, a neuroscientist, traveled to Chile to uh, take part in a Congress organized by Chile's Senate. During that visit, he shared his concern um, about the impact of uh, the progress in neuroscience and neurotechnologies. And he said that these developments needed to go hand in hand with safeguards for the protection of human rights. Among them, um, ESCE rights were included. So a collaboration was generated between him and the Committee for Challenges of the Senate to boost a historic constitutional reform that was passed last by the end of last year and a bill that would protect neuronal data, which is still being discussed in the Congress of Chile. And this work allowed to understand the dimension of the challenges 
and the IGIS Foundation, along with the neural rights initiatives and other and others started working to escalate the discussion to a regional level, inviting a group of experts to participate in this process at the OAS. The group was designed with persons from the legal and the uh, scientific arenas. And conversations were started with more people who received the documents and also sent their opinions. During the several meetings that were organized, the group was able to express its concerns and their contributions were um, submitted and then uh, the declaration was passed. And this collaborative work was the first of its kind in the Americas, in particular in Latin America and the Caribbean. Yes, it is true that the main stakeholders of this technological and scientific progress uh, landmarks are everywhere around the world, but their consequences are a strong risk for a great part of humankind and increase all kinds of gaps in health, in education, the labor work, or even democracy. And through this hearing, we wish to visualize the Commission's opportunity to take on leadership on such an important discussion that will affect human rights, especially in terms of privacy. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. My name is Constanza Alvial. As a coordinator of, uh, the, uh, of our group, we started to, be, uh, to design a self-managed survey to understand uh, local legislations in terms of these issues being discussed today. The idea was to investigate on the existing uh regulations with regards to the right to privacy because we understood that the actual regulations on uh, neural rights was non-existing that's how we got an answer from 13 countries in the american continent and 14 from europe in total 27 countries took part in our survey and every attorney that took part in it even though they received the survey on the right to privacy, which we knew was a more developed piece of legislation, they all met and needed to become more aware of the existing investigation on neural rights and neural technologies at a local and at a global level. What do you think we got to when we systematize the gathered information? An urgent need to install neural rights at a continental level. Why is that? Because even though we were expecting this, the um, deficiency in the normatives on the right to privacy in many countries in the region allowed us to see that international organizations needed to push for the development of these legislations without waiting for each country to do so, because it would be too late and the law would, instead of preventing, would have to repair. That's why the experts group was created, which had um, members from all uh, countries, as Amelie explained, but also um, we need to understand how urgent this is and the deficiencies in everything that has to do with this specific issue. Thank you very much. Hi, good morning. My name is Ciro Colombara. I'm part of the um, board of, um, I'm the president of Fundación Arnau. After this presentation by the civil society, we would like to establish, to present one of our requests for the committee, commission. Number one, we hope that through Redesca, a study and monitoring process is initiated on neurotechnologies and human rights, focused on identifying the impacts and risks 
related to ESEU rights, and in, especially the right to health and science. Second, we suggest that Redesca should open a dialogue channel with UNESCO and other stakeholders to discuss artificial intelligence, ethics, human rights, and neurotechnologies in related to the right to health, the right to education, and the right to science. Third, we request that Redesca summons uh, specialists to establish a dialogue to analyze the impacts, the impact in terms of ESE rights, ESCR rights. And finally, we hope that the rapporteurship for persons with disabilities starts monitoring the impact of neurotechnologies on that collective. And we hope it will generate a participatory um, process to identify strategic actions. Finally, the findings of these processes should be published through resolutions or thematic reports on these subjects. So we have presented our conclusions and petitions, and now we are at the disposal of this honorable commission to answer your questions. Thank you very much. Let's begin with the participation of the commission. First, I would like to know if Commissioner Hernandez has any comments or questions. Thank you, Madam President. Good morning, everyone here. I would like to congratulate you on this hearing and to thank you for having summoned our commission to listen to your uh, presentation on such a new um, event topic for us, it is for me at least, and you have presented very specific suggestions and the suggestions made by um, Mr. Colomara for the uh, special rapporteur uh, will be very useful for her. I'm sure she will have uh, her answers for that. But for the commission, it's very important to be at the vanguard of uh, new developments that might have an impact on human rights. I think it's very clear for all of us that the commission would always, will always want most people to enjoy their right to mental and physical health. But you are also telling us about the need to observe how these technological developments might affect other human rights and fundamental freedoms. I won't repeat everything because your presentation was very specific. I would also like to celebrate the fact that the committee already established uh, declaration of principles. We appreciate the work of the experts, as was mentioned here, and I'm very happy we can use this as a starting point. This will help the Commission to assess within its mandate uh, how to approach this topic. I would like to um, say, ask if on the next round you could tell us about what Ms. Serrano mentioned as procedural safeguards which is an important item for the work of the commission. Basically, how can we safeguard the rights that are recognized in the American Convention, considering the challenges or dangers that may pose these new technologies? Thank you very much, Madam President. Thank you. Now, Commissioner Roberta Clark, do you have any questions or comments? Uh, thank you very much and uh, good morning, everyone. I want to join Commissioner Hernandez in thanking you for this um, present, these presentations uh, and, and for bringing to the Commission's attention this, I mean, very vital um, component of an evolving, rapidly evolving uh, technology and its implications for a range of human rights. I was struck by maybe three main issues, which I, all together uh, you, you brought to our attention. One, well, sort of, first of all, the, the normative, what you call the normative um, loophole, which I very much agree with you on, that normative loophole is at national level as well as regional and international level. But in the context of that normative loophole, you allowed us to sort of reflect on what I think about three main issues. One, the need for regulation, um, and also for uh, prevention and, and I suppose remedies 
for abuses and misuses of neurotechnology. Secondly, the need to ensure insofar as neurotechnologies represent significant progress, which, which, which they do, um, the need to ensure equality of access and non-discriminatory access to neurotechnologies. And, and there was a, I recognize the focus on people living with disabilities, but um, also the question of uh, equality of access through the prism of economic, social, and cultural rights. Many people with low incomes can't access the technologies, particularly in the context of healthcare and education. And some of you mentioned the digital divide. So uh, also really important. And thirdly, sort of the large democratic issue on the participation of peoples across our diversities on the, on, on the reflections, on the use and misuse of neurotechnologies and the need to regulate them. So, you know, the old adage, nothing uh, for us without us, the importance of participation. Um, I wanted to also say, I, I certainly recognize, uh, as you have pointed out to us, the need for standards. Uh, and I wanted to ask one or two questions. First of all, maybe some questions which relate to know more. Um, I, I think the first speaker, Mr. Genzi, you spoke about uh, five types of rights that needed to be, had some specific protection. And I wanted to hear some more about the protection from algorithmic bias to which you referred and how does that show up in our region? Algorithmic bias, is it, is it showing up? And that's related to my next question for any one of you. Are there studies on the use of neurotechnologies in any of our countries in the region or regional synthesis on how neurotechnologies are being rolled out and um, the, the threats that are emerging from an actual rollout of neurotechnologies? So those are sort of my, my two main questions. And just to, to recognize the need for the standards that are specific to neurotechnologies and also to recognize that this is rapidly evolving. Someone also spoke about the use of neurotechnologies for surveillance and the idea of decoding and manipulating thought. And um, I know this is not a scientific hearing, but I would like to hear a little bit more about the real threats of that in the context of this region. Thank you very much. Very, very informative and obviously a whole area of work that the commission needs to um, engage with. Muchas gracias, comisionada. Paso a hacer también algunos comentarios. Me sumo a los agradecimientos eh, por la información. Thank you, Commissioner. I have a couple of comments, but yes, thank you so much for your presentation. I think that, as Commissioner Hernandez was saying, it's very important for uh, to have the participation of Redesca, but I was also thinking of other dimensions. Of course, the commission will have to assess this, for example, in its work with the Rapporteurship for Freedom of Expression and the thematic Rapporteurship. I was thinking about um, what you were saying about equality, non-discrimination, all the thematic um, aspects here. And with that in mind, I had a couple of questions. I think it's very important to uh, think on these surveys on normative um, normatives, but I also wanted to know if there is any kind of information, as Ms. Clark was saying, about what's going on in Latin America, some specific cases beyond the normative, which is, of course, very important, but are there specific cases? And I was also thinking of other things, like the case of women, access to reproductive health or sexual health or uh, the new forms of violence. And also, even though um, the declaration of the committee is quite recent because it's from last year, I wanted to know if you know anything about the, um, the impact of the recommendations, because have you had any follow up work on that so we can assess it? And once again, thank you very much. It's a very challenging issue and we've seen it in so many dimensions, though, of course, the work um, the, with, for the rapporteurship of persons with disabilities, but I think that all the thematic rapporteurships could analyze this and the challenges posed by these new technologies. Now I will give the floor to the our, um, to Ms. Pulido. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. Good morning, everyone. I just want to share with you a piece of information. 
I would like to say first that Mr. Carlos Bernal, that is rapporteur on persons with disabilities, he wanted to be here, but because of some personal issues, he was not able to be here today. Um, regarding the information that I want to share with you, I would like to say that the commission is working on a report on the situation of rights of persons with disabilities and the hemisphere. Um, last week, we sent a survey to all the states of the region, and we will have also a public consultation. We believe that an issue such as this will be very relevant uh, for that report. So that would be also far, Madam President. Thank you so much. Now I would like to give the floor to the special rapporteur, Soledad Garcia Munoz. Thank you, Madam President. I would like to kindly greet all those who are here with us today, who have presented today. And I would like to recognize how innovative this hearing is and how important it is for the agenda of the commission. As the president was saying, we need to address this issue from an intersectional approach. Um, it's important that we create an agenda of dialogue with an intersectional approach by including the different rapporteurships of the commission, which may have an impact. And I also would like to know more from you, do you have any specific examples of future advances that could be a concern? I thought about the possibility of decoding and manipulating human thought. And I think that the commission should know more about the advances that exist in this matter and the challenges ahead. The I would like to know more regarding the impact on the right to health. And also I would like to know what do you think about businesses and human rights? I think that this, it is very timely that the commission continues to have a dialogue with UNESCO. We are having different dialogues uh, through the Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression, the Commission, the Rapporteurship on Economic, Social, Cultural, and Environmental Rights. We are all discussing different rights. And it's important that the Inter-American Juridical Committee also has a permanent contact with the Commission. We are at your disposal and we really count on you to continue improving the efforts in this matter. Thank you so much. Thank you, Soledad. So we will start with the second round of interventions by civil society organizations. Thank you. We have um, taken down your questions. Some of the answers need a lot of explanations. So we will be sending you additional information if we need to supplement those answers. There are several questions. I will mention some of them, which I consider more relevant. And we had agreed on um, speaking on safeguards. Silvia will be covering this. Everything that has to do with discrimination and surveillance, Jared will be covering uh, them if uh, it's possible. And after that, we will have other issues that have to do with the declaration um, and the regional uh, normative. Maybe Amelie and Constanza can be discussing that. And also uh, the impact on persons with disabilities and that will be covered by Juan Fernandez and Maria Isabel. So I will begin. Thank you so much for your questions and for your interest in this matter. Thank you, Commissioner Soledad Garcia. And also I would like to thank Maria Claudia Pulido for her comment. I would like to answer the question regarding procedural safeguards. 
I mentioned four that are very important in this context. And some of them have to do with mechanisms of access to information or in transparency to understand the current development of neurotechnologies in the states and by private actors. Those procedural safeguards are the ones who allow us to have a diagnosis on the current status of development of neurotechnologies and their implications in the area of human rights in the short, mid and long term. And also we have those safeguards that are related to accountability mechanisms and access to justice, for example, effective legal remedies to face possible human rights violations. Um, these are related with the application of the technologies and implications that they may have on the different rights. These safeguards that have to do with transparency, accountability, access to information, and effective legal remedies are procedural safeguards that are very well related to the framework of human rights and public policies developed by the Commission over the years. And these safeguards are represented in the obligations of the states to make sure that the design of public policies includes a human rights perspective. Also, the safeguards are very well related to the duties of supervision and control of states. The commission has developed this very well and the court has done so as well. And these safeguards are very important, especially in the private sector or also in public initiatives, especially when there is a specific risk for the exercise of human rights. So these safeguards are very well related to public policies and human rights, uh, review and control of public policies, and also they are very well related to the framework of companies and human rights, the use of guiding principles. Um, these could be very relevant. It's important that we have a specific standards to see how we can include these safeguards in the context of neurotechnologies. I just want to make a short additional comment regarding what Commission, uh, Commissioner Lisa Mantisha said regarding privacy and implications. President was asking about sexual and reproductive health, uh, but something that we did not mention before have to do with the way in which many, one of the main risks has to do with privacy. Um, we need to understand that neural data should be protected by arbitrary interventions, but this is also related to confidentiality in the area of health. Neural data are health data, they are brain data. They have to do with the body of human beings. And therefore, there should, we should have data protection, but also we should have protection that have to do with confidentiality and professional secrecy um, in the health area. This is something that is rather new in the inter-American system. That, so there is an opportunity to develop this. And also regarding a comment made by the Rapporteur Soledad Garcia, she mentioned um, technologies to manipulate and decode human thought. I just want to say that the development of this technology is not uh, clear, is not well defined. Some technologies can read some neural data, some could interpret data in the future or decode them. But in the midterm, some technologies could have other implications such as manipulation or change of thought or behavior, or they could amplify uh, mental capacity or brain capacity. So what we need to see is how human rights bodies can face the immediate challenges of the current development of neurotechnologies, but it's important that these organs anticipate those serious implications that are very difficult to cover within the traditional human rights framework. We know that this is to come and we need to anticipate and 
human rights organs should anticipate this. Thank you so much. Um, I would like to add two important things. Uh, you talked about inter um, artificial intelligence. It's a um, conversation similar or related to neurotechnologies and neural rights. And many of the concerns that we are voicing today have to do with artificial intelligence as well, especially when it comes to um, discriminatory, discriminatory bias created by algorithms. The UN has made some uh, work. Uh, we have reports by rapporteurs or some treaties, such as, for example, the Committee Against Racial Discrimination, which passed last year a recommendation to prevent the discriminatory use of algorithms or um, police intelligence databases. In terms of neural rights, um, there is also a possibility that these new technologies, neural technologies can benefit from some um, advances or they could be benefited by inter, um, artificial intelligence. So these two discussions or these two matters are related. Many of the principles that we are discussing today um, are similar. Regarding the impact of the Inter-American Declaration, as we were saying, this declaration is a first approach to this matter. Uh, it's not about developing final principles. What we want to do is to voice our concerns. These are a set of issues that should be addressed. And we believe that the other bodies of the OAS, states, companies, scientists, academia, civil society should be informed so that the development of Inter-American principles is, is done by all the actors. Jared, you have the floor now. Uh, thank you very much. Um, let me just uh, make three quick comments um, uh, in relation to the discussion so far. Um, first, uh, Commissioner Clark asked about uh, the right to freedom from al uh, algorithmic bias. Um, and while I don't have any regional specific examples, uh, we already know that um, Neurotech uh, is already connecting to and will connect to AI, artificial intelligence to process data. And we've seen a lot of algorithmic bias in AI, such as racially biased data sets in facial recognition systems. I think the bottom line uh, on this topic is that we need to ensure that the neurological future that we face is equitable and representative of our global mosaic of experiences, ideas, backgrounds, and identities. Um, second, there was a question about uh, misuse or abuse of neurotech in the Americas. Again, uh, I don't have any America specific um, examples, but the general concerns already exist and are already clear globally with respect to consumer neurotechnology products, which are not regulated in any serious way in the Americas or anywhere else around the world. Um, and these are existing neurotechnology products that, uh, for example, can monitor um, whether one is concentrating uh, or uh, one is uh, meditating uh, and these kinds of more rudimentary uh, uh, um, uh, pieces of technology. Um, the Neural Rights Foundation is working with Consumer Reports on a, a new project that will be evaluating the user agreements of these neurotechnology products. Um, and you know what you find from doing an initial review of these um, user agreements, you know when you get a new piece of technology, you're often asked to log into an app and to click yes, you agree um, to this very very long user agreement that almost no one ever reads. Um, and it turns out that when it comes to consumer neurotech products, most of these uh, user agreements, for example, um, already uh, implicate human rights, civil rights, and privacy rights violations, um, such as, for example, when you say yes, you agree to use a neurotech product, then your brain scan is uploaded to the cloud and you've actually permanently and irrevocably given away your brain scan to this company. Um, you know, today only one to 2% of what is in the brain scan 
and be interpreted. And down the road, uh, it would be very possible, uh, it's expected to be possible, to be able to, for example, read a person's thoughts during the time that they were uh, taking the brain scan. Um, so we need international protections like a, uh, like a right of mental privacy, uh, but also national legal and regulatory frameworks. Um, the last point I'll make is just uh, finally that what we're talking about here is not science fiction, but science. As one illustration of this, last year, a person who was paralyzed and nonverbal in the study that was published um, was uh, provided with neurotechnology that enables them now to communicate using mind reading technology at 18 words a minute with 99% accuracy. And it is expected that in the next three to five years, such technology may be available with a wearable brain computer interface. Um, as everyone knows well, Article 13 of the American Convention on Human Rights has a right to freedom of thought. But so far, because there's been no uh, cases put forward to this um, uh, to this set of issues, um, the American uh, the Inter-American Commission has yet to interpret that provision to include, for example, a right of mental privacy. So these are all areas that um, are rapidly approaching and that will require, um, I think, substantial additional work. Gracias. Eh, a continuación, Ciro Thank you. Colombara. Now Ciro Colombara and Amelie Keen and then Constanza will be taking the floor. With regard to the question on the use of neurotechnology in the region and the risks ahead, taking into consideration what Jared Jenser said, um, even though that Chile has a constitutional reform to protect uh, neural rights, there is another case that discusses the use and abuse of uh, human rights by businesses because of the appropriation of brain data or the use of brain data without the consent of the users. Uh, the case in Chile will set an international precedent because it's the first case at a global level. I want to mention this because this case uh, we lead to a discussion on this serious matter. With regard to the regional diagnosis, there uh, were several questions regarding the current situation and the cases that are happening across the region. We are right now collecting information. We do know since we are in conversation with academia and scientists, we are seeing that there is a lot of progress made in around the world and in the region, especially in terms of brain research and the development of technologies. In terms of regulation, Brazil, Mexico, and Argentina are working on these matters. They are discussing the possibility of creating bills. Uh, we know that um, Brazil is working a lot in those, Mexico has, also is also promoting this process. So we are talking to some of the actors in the region who are working on these matters. And precisely, there is not much information so far. So that's why we are uh, bringing this to the table because we need to develop inter-American principles in this matter. What we want to do is to make the situation visible, taking into consideration the size of the challenges ahead. We want to show the level of risk related to neurotechnologies, especially um, we need to focus in the, on the region. There are several organizations such as UNESCO who are working actively in terms of the protection of rights. Also the OECD is working on these matters as well. So we have some uh, actions, but we know that this will be something very important in the region in the coming years. So we need to um, work in this together. We are working together with lawyers across the region. Constanza will be talking about this. Thank you, Amelie. And I just wanted to say that one of the challenges that we are seeing when we try to analyze or assess cases, we have this case in Chile that will be uh, a precedent and this is related to the right of privacy. And that's why it's so difficult to assess cases. How I access private data of a person. And this is not about 
access, but it's about the use of those data, especially those who capture this data and they use those data for purposes different from which what they were stated. So if the person access, as, uh, accepts or say yes, there could be some cases in which information is used for a different purpose. But talking about neural rights and how my will was manipulated or a different will or a different use was made of my data, that it's very difficult to regulate. And this will lead to several legal proceedings and trials because we don't have regulations or laws in this matter. How can I prove that the will of the business or the person who is using my data was not my will? This is some crazy. We are seeing a lot of advertisement on social media. They push me to make decisions that are not my decisions. So where is my will and my self-determination? So, and this is what makes us human beings, our possibility of making decisions. So all, everything that has to do with human rights is very difficult to address. When we live or we don't, if we don't have our will or our self-determination, we won't be able to talk about rights. So we need to see how we are going to address these cases. We need to see how we are going to create regulations and we need to have this um, precedence uh, because this will help us to have sound legislation and regulations. In the Americas, we can cross uh, or to see information to see how these privacy uh, rights are being addressed. And maybe we could address how we can see how states are addressing this taking into consideration the current legislation of regulations they have so far. So now I would like to give the floor to Juan Fernando and Jose, but I see that Commissioner Joel Hernandez is raising his hand. Don't worry, civil society speaks first. Remarks about the risks and how to handle some situations. In particular, I would like to talk about the legal capacity of persons with disabilities because uh, neurotechnologies might be useful to express that legal capacity. That's one of the main um, points forward in the declaration because it recognizes the possibility to fully exert that legal capacity without needing a um, proxy, a legal representative, but by doing it directly by themselves. And neurotechnologies can um, assist people in different forms, in particular, with the support the, uh, figure defined in the um, declaration, those um, assists that help people um, exert their capacities, because it says that uh, these faculties or capacities can be exerted by uh, individual persons and by uh, legal persons, because there will be companies specializing in neurotechnologies that, 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 can, uh, that can provide the service of helping people um, manifest their will. Of course, that can help them, but of course, uh, that entails a risk as well in terms of the manipulation that could take place, especially if we're talking about uh, corporate elements. Now, because of the, the convention and the local laws say that the personal preferences and the history of um, people should be observed, those who wish to manifest their will. And also the possibility to make a mistake, which is one of the um, rights that are respected or observed in the declaration and in the local pieces of legislation and also in terms of reasonable um, adjustments 
neurotechnologies can be useful in um, doing these reasonable adjustments in different spheres. In some countries, like mine, the possibility of manifesting your will must be done in certain cases through notaries or extrajudicial conciliators, but also in for different proceedings that uh, people do with their governments. So these safeguards will be necessary for those um, who wish to manifest their will so that there will be no manipulation there. Finally, in terms of what can be done with the government, there's a need for governments to be aware of the principle of functional equivalence, a principle that is part of international law, in particular when it has to do with manifestations of will through new technologies. And if the same factions are being um, operated with through us certain technologies, then they will have the same legal value. And as Juan Fernando was saying, in the world, persons with disabilities are still second rate citizens. That's how they are treated. We have a wonderful convention, a wonderful uh, international regulationary framework that um, give rights to people. We have international treaties that are enforced in Chile at least, but sometimes in practice, we see that that's, that doesn't really happen. We have the um, Inter-American Convention for the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination, but when in reality, in the way public policies are implemented in different countries, we don't see that happening. And of course, there's no gender perspective, which was mentioned in one of the questions, and it's super important. According to some studies, women with disabilities tend to suffer more violence than men with disabilities. Just to give you an example, in Chile, 61% of persons with disabilities are not working. They are outside the labor market. And thanks to a law, and that's why um, the normative is so important, thanks to um, law, 24,000 people have now entered the labor market, but out of them, 65% are men, and only 35% are women. And Chile has more women with disabilities than men. So I, we could show you tons of regulations that since they lack gender perspective, they are not useful because internationally, women are more associated to lack of labor inclusion, of uh, economic independence. So we need to understand that one of the articles that um, are preferred by us is universal accessibility, which isn't just uh, letting people, uh, giving people an elevator for wheelchairs. It also means access to information. So it's very important that all of this information in terms of uh, research and new technologies for persons with disabilities, they all need to be informed to the families and caregivers of persons with disabilities. And they should all give their consent to the use of their information. And as Juan Fernando was saying, the importance of reasonable adjustments that have to do with how we make these technologies adaptable to the particular needs of each person, because each person with a disability is a world unto themselves. Of course, we can generalize depending on the type of disability, but each person will have specific requirements. And we believe it's super important to have these uh, procedures with gender perspective, but also with the um, motto of nothing about us without us, which is a very important motto for us. We did, all the work we did was taking into consideration uh, the opinion of the users of persons with disabilities. That's very important. Thank you. We would like to thank the Commission for the time they have given us to discuss these new emerging issues that are not part of the future. They are part of the reality. New technologies are not the future. They are a reality that we are facing nowadays. 
many of the opinions presented here, especially those that had to do with um, privacy, with discrimination, with the impact on uh, minorities, on persons with disabilities. And all these are issues that we hope the commission considers that Bredesca starts considering in its new working plans. Of course, we are at your disposal. We can collaborate in all of those processes, and we would love to continue to work on the process of the um, juridical committee to generate principles that might serve as guidelines for the work of the civil society, of the private sector, and of, of states as well. Finally, I would like to thank experts who worked throughout these months in drafting these principles and the Inter-American Declaration, Veronica Inestrosa, Mr. Yuste, Silvia Serrano, Mr. Colombara, Tomás de la Cuadra Salcedo, Francesca Panucci, and Eduardo Bertoni, who gave us the pillars for the discussion in this uh, region, and we're very thankful. Our foundation is, of course, at your disposal to continue to work on this process and to collaborate with the Commission in everything it needs. We understand that there are many topics that maybe were left unanswered, so we will send an additional report after this hearing with whatever topics uh, were left open. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we are about to wrap up, but we still have a couple of minutes, so I will give the floor to Commissioner Hernandez. You, we cannot hear you, Joel. Thank you, Madam President, for this second opportunity. I would like to make one final reflection after listening to such interesting remarks. When in the world we consider that codification and the progressive development of international law is finally done, and that all aspects or of life are now part of treaties, uh, we always find new challenging spheres. And this is one of them. I imagine that but the print in the principles adopted by the committee, other developments might follow in terms of the political bodies of the OAS. A uh, course of action for the committee is that they send their documents for the approval of the General Assembly. And that's where I think that eventually there might follow a treaty on this issue because that would allow us to um, have, have a specific uh, treaty on um, everything that has been discussed here today. Of course, that could be done by the UN or the European Council, which are bodies that address these issues as well, human rights and ethics, among others. I think that a convention would allow us to give um, legal certainty to states, but it would also help foster norms because uh, international law norms usually end up being translated into local or national legislation. That's what we see in Chile, for example. Of course, this is not for the commission. It's not, we, we do not draft treaties, but I do see a role to play by the civil society as a possible avenue. The commission will develop inter-American principles and Redesca has um, taken notes on this, but of course, as our president said, this is a transversal issue that the commission needs to address in its forthcoming period of sessions. Thank you very much, Madam President. Thank you. Yes, it is not up to us to promote treaties, but it is to universalize and promote the already existing treaties like the American Convention. It's a very interesting issue. I would just like to remind us all that we are preparing a report 
on the human rights of persons with disabilities, which will include a chapter on legal capacity. And it will be very important for everyone to take part in the survey that will soon be at your disposal. So we can, find, we can now wrap up this hearing with thanking you for presenting these challenges. As Commissioner Hernandez was saying, this goes to show that um, the evolution of human rights is very important. And as Maria Jose was saying about women with disabilities and the differentiated impact of disability, because beyond women with disabilities, every person with disability, they are usually cared for by a woman. So this all has to do with care plans and how technology might assist them in terms of inclusion. So I will wrap up. Thank you once again. We'll stay in touch. Thank you for all your work. The Commission appreciates your bringing our attention to these topics. Uh, thank you very much and have a great day. Thank you. Bye. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everyone.